today we're here at the museum and we have a distinguished roster of guests to share their insights with us. And not just uh, with us here in the room, but the entire event, as you here in the room know, is being live streamed on YouTube, on Politico, and our friends on the cable side are coming in and out of the interviews this afternoon. We have asked the uh, public to participate um, in this event using Google Moderator, which is Google's public engagement tool that gave people between Friday and noon today the opportunity to ask questions and vote on others that should be asked um, throughout this program today. Our guests will include some of the biggest innovators and game changers on, web, on the web and in politics. Co-sponsoring today's program is Politico, and I am delighted to turn the microphone over to Politico's chief political correspondent, you know who he is, Mike Allen, for his interview with the president's senior advisor, David Axelrod. Mike is the author, please applause, it's Mike Allen. Mike is the author of The Playbook, which is the Bible of politics from the White House to, well, everyone else who cares about the political conversation in this country. So please, let's give them a warm welcome again while they're getting all, uh, all hooked up. Thanks, Thank Mike. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you very much. The Bible, huh? Exactly. The Bible. Who can argue with that? Oliver North used to tell a joke when he was running for Senate. He would say, every morning I wake up and I read the Bible and the Washington Post. Get both sides. <laughs> Uh, David, thank you very much uh, for being here. Senior advisor to the president, you have a big responsibility going into the fall. Your campaign was known as the tech savviest, the hippest campaign in 2008. How has technology changed for this fall? How is technology going to affect this fall's races and looking ahead to 2012? Well, well first of all, just looking back uh, to 2008, obviously technology played a huge uh, part in our campaign. I'm not sure that a Barack Obama could have been elected president of the United States, but for the fact that we were able to uh, uh, build a relationship with people all over the country uh, through the internet. Communities grew up often self-generated uh, to support that candidacy. We organized through the internet. Uh, a lot of our fundraising was done in small contributions uh, through the internet. I think you, you're going to see those trends and you're seeing those trends continue here. But That's a great democratizing. The other side has They're tricks. not tricks, Mike. They're, uh, <laughs> yes, I, I think that uh, both, both you see on both sides of the campaigns. I think some of the Tea Party candidacies have been propelled by some of these uh, grassroots uh, uh, techniques. And, uh, and so uh, they, it is going to have uh, an impact. People are organizing uh, through the Internet as we organize through the Internet. They're raising money. Uh, through the internet. Uh, you see uh, the, the Democrat National Committee has, you know, 13.8 fans on, on Facebook, I think 5 point, uh, 13.8 million, thir 13 right. uh, million uh, 5.5 5 follower, a million followers on uh, Twitter. This uh, enables you, us to have a... Uh, Are you allowed to tweet? Well, uh, no, uh, Gibbs is the auth authorized uh, 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 Tweet guy, uh, on uh, in the White House, but um, you know, but I do f post things from time to time, and we do engender a reaction. We've had a a, a a a very aggressive program at the White House to have a dialogue with the American people and put the president in uh, online press conferences and responding to uh, uh, questions and so on. It, it is a it is a very healthy uh, and positive thing. I see that uh, our friends on the Republican side also. Uh, put this America Speaking Out uh, site on there. The thing about that is, when you look and this at was the House for their Republican pledge that to led to their, uh, their 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 pledge to America, and the number, of, the interesting thing about it is, in order for these things to be effective, you, you don't have you 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 can't just establish a dialogue. You also have to listen. The number one item on their list was to end these tax cuts for corporations that send jobs overseas, but that didn't find its way into, into their uh, plan. They, another one was to uh, reform earmarks. Uh, that didn't find their way into their plan either. So they, they set up the device to listen. They just didn't listen. Uh, the House Republican leader, now the minority leader, he wants to be Speaker Boehner, uh, John Boehner. He was on television yesterday, and he said, once Americans understand how big the problem is, then we can begin to talk about potential solutions. 
What do you make of that? Well, I think what happened was they put out their solutions, and the solutions were so dismaying to so many people that they decided to back up a little uh, and uh, describe it merely as uh, a discussion of the problems. The fact is they did put out uh, a blueprint, and it looks so remarkably like what we saw before uh, this president took office. You know, Pete Sessions, who's the chairman of their campaign committee, said several weeks ago on television that we just want to go back to the same agenda <coughs> we had before. And of course, that was the agenda that uh, took Bill Clinton's uh, $237 uh, billion surplus and turned it into $1.3 trillion deficit that turned the special interests loose, Wall Street loose, the oil industry loose to write their own uh, rules, and ultimately led to the biggest economic uh, disaster since the Great uh, Depression. And uh, if you look at their plan closely, that's uh, the same precepts, the same tenets uh, are all there. So I think Mr. Boehner is now distancing himself a little from that. And you know, one of the interesting things about the new technology is the people who are the hardest uh, on their pledge were people uh, within the conservative movement uh, in their own party who uh, felt that it was pablum and, and were very quick uh, on, the, on the web to, to, to express themselves on it and got a real dialogue going. Uh, about this. So I'm not surprised to see that he's trying to back away from it now. All right. Well, David, you warned, the president warned. By the way, this notion that people need to know what the problems are, I think the American people understand what uh, the problems facing this country are. They want to know what direction we should go, and they don't want to go back. Well, they seem to be blaming your guy for some of the problems. How bearish are you about this fall? You clearly aren't well, bullish. Well, I, look, I told the president two years ago when we got briefed on uh, what was about to happen in the economy, what was happening in the economy, uh, that you know this was going to be a challenging election, that his numbers weren't going to be the same uh, now as they were two years ago. I said all of those folks who were being heralded as really smart guys were going to be called idiots by the time the next election rolled around. It was all, I think, very, very predictable. Uh, but uh, uh, I do think this is going to be an idiosyncratic election. You know, I watch, I read the Bible too. You know, uh, your Bible as well as mine. Amen. Uh, but, uh, uh, and I understand what the conventional wisdom is about this election. Uh, and certainly when you're the party, in, when you're the majority party, you're going to bear the brunt uh, of uh, people's frustration. And there's a lot of frustration out there, and understandably uh, so. We're digging out from a tremendous economic catastrophe, and a lot of people are still struggling through it. But what's different from the past elections, 94, for example, is the Republican Party brand is not strong at all. There's no real sense of, man, if we just had the Republicans in there, things would be better. Because I think people understand that uh, essentially Republicans aren't offering anything new. It's the same sort of uh, corporate special interest sponsored uh, party that was there before that uh, led to so many of the problems uh, that we have today, that it's not a party that's fighting uh, for the middle class. And, the kind of, uh, and it's not a party that will bring the kind of growth that will lift uh, most uh, people in this country. And I, I think that, uh, uh, so for that reason, I think that this is going to be an idiosyncratic election. You're going to see Democrats winning in places that you didn't expect them to win. And I, so uh, I'm eager for uh, November 2nd. I think it's going to be an interesting night. Wait, how could you be eager for November 2nd? Uh, I, I, as I said, I think it's going to be an interesting night. I, I, I'm not Pollyannish about it. I understand that uh, uh, you know, we have a much more exposed and in terms of seats, and we'll, we'll so, lose so some when ground. So you say it's an interesting night. Are you saying that it's going to be better? I than think, yes. I, as I said, I think we are going to uh, win some races that you guys perhaps don't think we're going to win, and the numbers are going to be a little bit different uh, than you guys uh, predict. What's a race that you're optimistic about that the conventional wisdom has you losing? Well, look, I think that uh, you look at some of these uh, uh, Senate races uh, that a few weeks ago uh, uh, people were, uh, were suggesting were slipping away from us, like in the state of Washington, for example, California. where Patty Murray in, in, in California, where Barbara Boxer uh, is, uh, is running against Carly Fiorina. Uh, I think what's happening all around the country is as people begin to focus on the choice and understand that this is not just a referendum on one party or on the state of the economy, but a choice between two directions. And they focus in on what the direction the Republican Party is offering, which is backward uh, to the policies that help create the disaster the same, uh, to the same formula. I, I think they're concerned. And, uh, and you're seeing some of these races open up in favor of Democrats. OK. David, we've been taking questions online through Google Moderator. 
the first one is from Jackie in Hamden, Connecticut. She says, I want to know what are the Democratic plans for heading off a watershed in November? She says, Democrats, <coughs> she's talking about you here, have been short selling our message. It's a shame we don't have a way to get out our message other than the president. The right has several talking points on their side. Like, why are Democrats <coughs> using the message war? Well, I, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm not going to sign on to that characterization. Uh, obviously, we have a, a little bit more uh, of, a, uh, of a burden in the sense that we're the majority party. The Republican Party has basically sat out the last 20 months, and they've been sloganeering while we've been trying to solve uh, some very difficult problems that they, uh, that they left us. It but, seems to have worked for them. But, uh, well, we'll see, Mike. We'll see. We, uh, not, the Politico, as important as it is, doesn't get to decide. The public gets to decide. All the folks who are watching today get to decide, and I think to the extent that people get galvanized. Every poll suggests the same thing, which is that, uh, that if there's a large turnout, that Democrats are going to do well. And the Republican advantage is largely predicated on the notion that it'll be a small turnout of very motivated anti-voters who will come out on behalf of Republican candidates. I don't think that's the way it's going to be, and I don't think that's the way it's going to be because we do have a message, and it's a message about how we rebuild this economy in a way that lifts uh, the middle class, that promotes small business. The president signed a bill that we fought for for uh, several months over Republican opposition in the Senate today to uh, cut eight different taxes for small businesses, to expand lending for small businesses desperately needed. We think that's part of the prescription uh, to move this country forward. We think uh, things like the credit card bill of rights to keep people from being exploited uh, uh, as they have been in the past by hidden fees and, uh, uh, and, and penalties is, is part of the formula of, 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 of standing up the middle class. We think uh, taking $60 billion in unwarranted subsidies to the banks and giving it to uh, kids who need uh, the help, working class kids who need to, uh, for college aid is the way to go. And by the way, one of the interesting things about that Republican plan that was released last week is that among their prescriptions for the future is to cut education by 20% and cut student aid for 8 million uh, kids across this country. Anybody who knows anything about the world today and the global economy in which we're in knows that that's not the direction we need to go. Chinese aren't cutting back on education. Uh, the Europeans aren't cutting back. The Indians aren't cutting back. Our competitors aren't cu cutting back. We need to improve our education system and give people more access and not le less access. So uh, there's a, there, there's a, there are two competing visions about how you how you, how you build a stronger economy, how you build a stronger country. One is being dictated by special interests and this notion that if we just cut taxes for the wealthiest Americans and give free reign to the special interests that uh, the economy will grow. Well, we tried that experiment. That's not, that's not quite we, how we, we, it. We, we, uh, well, uh, Mr. Gillespie's coming. He can describe it in his own way. Uh, but I think that we, if you look at what was done from 2001 to 2009, that's exactly uh, what happened. We, we tried this experiment. It ended in disaster. We lost four million jobs in the six months before this president took office. All right, now David, you and the president have been talking about the dangers of outside money coming into these races yes. because of the Citizens United ruling. Now, yeah. there's money on your side, too. Why is more coming in from the Republican side? Well, I think for a very simple reason is, and, and that is, the Supreme Court opened up a gaping hole that said that uh, corporate special interests could spend unlimited amounts of money uh, in these election campaigns. What's happened is that a series of uh, committees with uh, benign, benign sounding names like Americans for Prosperity and the Crossroads uh, Fund, America Crossroads Fund, uh, and so on, are taking in millions and millions of dollars from uh, sp uh, corporate special interests, uh, Wall Street, the oil company, and insurance companies, and they don't have to disclose it. It's kept secret. And they're running ads and they're pounding Democratic candidates uh, across the country to the tune of tens of millions of dollars. You could do a public service here, Mike. I know Ed's going to be here, and I like Ed. And when I'm, I took his job at the White House, he couldn't have been more uh, uh, helpful uh, in, make, in making that transition and uh, easier for me. Uh, and he's a thoroughgoing professional. He and Karl Rove are running one of the main... Uh, uh, vehicle for these contributions, you should uh, perform a public service and ask them to disclose who's funding all of these negative ads, these tens of millions of negative ads. You know, they say 
the only people who want to keep things secret are folks who have something to hide. Ask them what they're hiding. Okay, and just to be clear, they're not running it, but they uh, founded it, uh, got it no, going. No, but there, you, you saw the piece in the New York Times. Carl, who's, a, as we know, very shrewd Ed, a great political operative, are coordinating all these different groups. And they're operating, in the New York Times words, as a shadow party organization, running negative ads, paid for by millions of dollars from special interests who don't have to reveal the, their uh, participation. And what is your research showing you about how effective those are, how much a difference those ads are making? Well, look, I think, uh, I'll but give you one you example. In, the... in Colorado, uh, we have a very uh, close Senate race there. Senator Michael Bennett is running against uh, uh, Tom Buck, a, a Republican uh, candidate. He has been the beneficiary of uh, a torrent, Mr. Buck, uh, of negative ads against Michael Bennett. Thousands and thousands and thousands of gross rating points of negative ads week after week after week. Uh, Michael is holding up well. Uh, I think that he will win that race. But it's clearly a closer race than it would have been had there not been the spending on, on his behalf. And believe me, that is the purpose. I think you can ask Ed. I don't think they're spending tens of millions of dollars on negative ads and, and, and a flood of mail. Uh, for uh, for the exercise, they're doing it to try and influence these elections. Okay. Now, speaking of jobs in the White House, you've started to talk a little bit about your future plans. How long are you going to be in Washington? Well, you know, I've always uh, uh, had the understanding with the president that uh, sometime uh, after these two years, uh, probably sometime in the spring, that I would go back to Chicago and begin uh, working on the next project, uh, which is the re-election campaign. And, uh, and as, you, your as you be? as you know. Um, I, uh, my uh, family is still in Chicago. The hardest, mm -hmm. I, I love uh, uh, many, many aspects of this job, but the separation is not, uh, I also love my family, and the separation is something that's been difficult. So uh, for a variety of those reasons, uh, I'm going to go back. And my role will be essentially what it was uh, in the last campaign as a, as a strategist uh, working uh, with uh, the media and the message uh, in terms of uh, promoting our argument. Okay. We're going to bring in another question online from Google Moderator. This is from Gary Kubiak in Chicago. There you go. What effect will John Stewart's rally have on Election Day? You know, I don't know. I, I, uh, hopefully, I think the greatest uh, service that he and others can perform is to encourage people to participate. As I said, we're in the position where are the you, more people, are you the more about people. It sapping energy, or do you well, think it will help? the more people who uh, participate. Uh, I think the better off we're going to be. And I think it says something about uh, uh, our respective parties and our messages that, uh, uh, that uh, we're hoping for a larger turnout, they're hoping for a smaller turnout. Uh, one of the great things about this, this uh, exercise here today is we're going to reach a lot of people. Uh, and uh, my message to them, whether they're for us or, or, or for the other side, come out and participate. And I think John's uh, rally can help in that regard. The one concern I have is that it's right before the election, and there are people who will be at that rally who perhaps could be out contacting uh, friends and neighbors uh, and urging them to uh, come out. But uh, you know that's a trade-off we, we, we you know we'll, we'll live with. Okay. So on balance, you believe the Stuart Colbert rallies will be helpful to your side? Uh, I think to the extent that they encourage people to come out to vote and participate. Uh, you know, I think that they will. I, obviously, I don't know what they have planned. I know uh, they're both very, very um, smart and clever people. Uh, but, uh, but if at the end of the day, the notion is that it, it reminds people that there's ele an election. And by the way, in most of the country, that election is already beginning. In some states, early voting has already begun. So if people are uh, watching us today, they don't have to wait until November 2nd to cast a ballot. They can do it at any time. And uh, they can uh, go online, uh, certainly on, uh, uh, on uh, our uh, uh, website or other websites, and find out exactly what the details are uh, in order to cast those early votes. Now, David, you're looking trim. Uh, there's a little room there in your uh, collar size. You told me you were on a strict diet. Tell us what your secret well, is. The secret, the real secret was that I went on vacation. The first day I went on vacation, I got sick and learned that I had a parasite. So uh, that got me going in the right direction. That's not going to be a best-selling book. Like, no, 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 no. No, and uh, I want to make clear that this happened outside of Washington. This is not a commentary on Washington. I had a, a, a parasite. But, uh, and then when I started losing weight, and I, I thought, you know, this is not a bad idea. So I just kept going with it. I gained 30 pounds during the campaign and, I, and I've been, they've been stubborn pounds. That it turns out was related to the fact that I was eating everything that was put in front of me. And so I've decided that uh, to 
adopt a different strategy and be a little more measured in what I, what I eat. And how much have you lost? About 25 pounds. And what is your, so are you skipping meals or what are you, what's your, <laughs> what's your secret? Uh, no, I'm, I'm eating in, uh, with some discretion. So I'm eating more healthier food and I'm eating a little less of it. And you said you played basketball yesterday? What was that? I did, yeah. Well, I like doing that. I had been not done it for a while and I went back yesterday. And it turns out that being 25 pounds lighter is helpful. <laughs> so. uh, now, um, your departure uh, coming up uh, looks almost certain the chief of staff, Ronald Manuel, is headed out. A number of other uh, changes. These are all people who spend a lot of time with the president. Like the ecology around a president is very delicate. And that's going to have abrupt changes. Like, What's well, I think happen? you'll see some people uh, leave and some people stay. New folks will come in. Some of those people will be uh, very familiar to the president. Some will be new. You said you expect David Plouffe, the president's campaign well, manager, to come I, in. I certainly think that he's highly, highly prized and regarded by the president. And uh, he has said in the past that uh, he was uh, having rest, being uh, rested up for two years and written his book and uh, re, uh, recharged and spent time with his family. I think he's ready for... A duty if asked. Um, and will he be essentially taking your job or? That's a question for the president and I don't know that, uh, you know, I'm not here to make any announcements about uh, personnel, but I do believe that, uh, you know, I, I think there's an evolution in every administration. Uh, there are changes around this time. I think that's a healthy thing. Uh, I think it's good to bring in new energy, some different ideas, uh, folks who spent the last two years on the outside coming in. I, I think it's very positive and, uh, um, and uh, I look forward on the outside to working with uh, some of the folks who uh, will be coming in now. And do you think we'll see David Plouffe in the White House before the end of the year? As I said, I'm not making any, uh, I would doubt that and I'm not making any personnel pronouncements. One thing I can tell you is David Plouffe is as integral uh, to uh, the president and his operations as, as anybody. We wouldn't be here without the leadership he provided in the campaign. He's a, he's a person of enormous talent and great principle. So whatever he does in service of the, the administration and the president will be, uh, will be valued and important. Now, uh, in addition to these sorts of personnel changes, after this election, clearly the elections are going to be close. Clearly Republicans are going to be stronger regardless of who has control of the chambers. What is the administration to do to say, we get it? What are you going to do to say you responded to what you've heard voters say? Well, look, I think that uh, one of the things voters are saying is they want to see uh, some level of cooperation to solve problems. And we have extended uh, that invitation uh, repeatedly over the last 20 months. My hope is that as we come out of uh, this election, however it uh, uh, turns out, that uh, there will be on the other side uh, a, a new willingness to participate. My concern, uh, because we all have a responsibility that goes beyond partisan responsibilities to move this country forward, and nobody has a premium on good ideas. But here's the thing. Uh, I get concerned when I read Senator DeMint say his goal is, uh, is uh, gridlock. I get concerned when I hear uh, on, the, on, the Republic, on the House side, the vice chair of their congressional committee saying, uh, re warning Republicans that we may have to have a government shutdown, so be prepared for that. I don't think that's what the country is asking for. They want more cooperation, not less, uh, because they understand we face great challenges, and we're prepared uh, to do that. But, uh, but you know, the question is what will happen on the other side. I think you're going to see some great struggles uh, within that Republican caucus on the other side, because you've got the kind of uh, establishment corporate Republicans here in Washington. Uh, and then you've got these Tea Party folks who have uh, an entirely different view. You saw some of that friction last week when they came up with their retrograde uh, pledge to America that was so reminiscent of the things that got us into trouble in the first place. So uh, I think it's going to be an interesting time in this town. Now, David, what do you believe the Tea Party's effect will be on the Republicans in 2012 as they start to look for their nominee? Well, it'll be interesting. You know, look, I, I think that the Tea Party movement is a grassroots movement. It may be, you know, some of it may be encouraged. We, we read the story in The New Yorker about the uh, Koch brothers, the oil billionaires who were kind of under the table and secretly funding some of the organizing efforts for the Tea Party. But on, in the it's main... It's not that secret. Well, it isn't anymore. But uh, it, it, I don't think it was meant to be... Uh, believe me, when the Tea Party folks went to their meetings, 
uh, no one put a sign up saying brought to you by, the, by a couple of oil billionaires. I, I guarantee you that that wasn't the case. But it was ferreted out by a reporter, and now it's, it's widely, uh, widely discussed. Uh, I think it's going to be an interesting process. Normally, the Republican Party has been a top-down party. The folks in Washington decide who the candidate's going to be, and it generally is that candidate. That was true with uh, Dole. It was true with Bush. It was true with McCain. Uh, now they have this grassroots movement. Uh, within the party, and I think there's going to be a big struggle. I, I'm sure that uh, that Ed and Carl and others think that they, 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 they'll be in a position to once again dictate who the candidate will be. Uh, I'm not sure that's the case. Now, who do you worry about for 2012? Who on their side is strong? I worry about you, Mike. <laughs> I'm not, not on the ballot. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to handicap uh, their candidates. And, and, and just let's be, let's remind ourselves that in uh, at this time in 2006, uh, Barack Obama wasn't even contemplating uh, a race uh, or an, uh, uh, a race. He wasn't ra being ra contemplated. He was uh, contemplating a race. Well, no, uh, maybe by this time in 2006, but just beginning to contemplate uh, running uh, for president. Uh, this is an eternity, right? So we don't really know who so all the players will be. And the thing about <laughs> the new technology and uh, the new political reality in this country is that you can start a race up much more quickly uh, than you've done in the past. So you think there could be somebody that we're not focusing on? There may be. Now, and what do you think of the New Jersey governor, Chris Christie? Would he be a strong candidate? Well, I, look, I, I, I actually like him, so I just doomed his candidacy by saying that. But, uh, no, I think he's a serious person, and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, I don't agree with everything uh, that he's doing, but he's an attractive person. Uh, uh, person, but he just got elected governor. He's trying to do some things in New Jersey. We don't know what the outcome of some of his policies uh, will be, and I would be doubtful that uh, he would leave the work he just began and start a race for president. I think he's been pretty clear on that. Now, the president's going to be out very heavily this fall. The first lady also has announced a heavy schedule of rallies. She's going to be out um, a lot. She's avoided politics until now. What do you think the effect will be of having her out there? How did you talk her into it? Well, look, I don't think she's, she's it's not going to be politics in the traditional sense. She's not going to be out there uh, sort of engaging in the, in the back and forth of campaigns. She is going to go out there and uh, lift up principles and candidates who stand for the things that uh, she and the president uh, care deeply about, particularly as they relate to families and children. This is her focus, uh, uh, both in public policy and in life. And uh, so uh, she wants to affirm candidates who have stood with her on some of these, uh, uh, and with the president on some of these uh, uh, questions. And, uh, and, and, and so, does she, who does she appeal to, or what do you think her effect will be? How will she help? I think she's a, a very, very popular person, uh, uh, and not just among uh, Democrats. Uh, obviously, I think uh, as someone who is uh, who is uh, so concerned about uh, families and the struggles of uh, work. Uh, family balance and so on. I think uh, obviously a lot of uh, uh, women uh, will be interested in her message, but not just women. Uh, so I, I think she'll have impact out there, but um, I, kn I know there's a lot of interest in, in seeing her, and uh, she's eager to go. Okay. Now we've got a question through Google Moderator. Now we have Google in person with a question uh, here in the audience. And if you could just introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Peter Posse from Arlington, Virginia. I had a question. Um, what will you or the White House do if Republicans win the Senate or if Republicans win enough seats to slow or stop some of the legislation you haven't yet passed? Um, well, first of all, I don't know. Purely if hypothetical. Been, yes. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not going to deal with hypotheticals. But on your last point, uh, I don't know if you've been watching for the last couple of years, but they've slowed a lot of stuff down as it is. In fact, the, no, the normal course of events in the United States Senate for the last 20 months has been that uh, the Republicans have filibustered. And sometimes they filibustered on things that they then ended up voting for. In other words, they've stopped us from getting an up or down majority <laughs> vote. We've had nominees. We have, uh, uh, there's a, a record number of judicial nominees who are being held up, many of whom have been approved on a bipartisan basis by committees. And simply to slow the work of the Senate down, uh, they have stalled those uh, appointments. The result is that we've got a critical lack of, of people on the bench in the federal judiciary. We're trying to deal with that. Uh, right now, so that wouldn't be a new development. You know, what we're hoping for is a different philosophy, and if the Republicans have more votes, uh, uh, presumably they'll have more responsibility uh, that goes along with it, and I think the American people 
will demand that. We have great challenges as a country. I'm really confident we can meet them, but only if we, uh, only if we work together to do that. And uh, we haven't seen that yet, but perhaps with a, 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 a few more seats in the, each chamber, they'll feel more of a sense of responsibility. Okay. Thank you for that question, Peter. Now, uh, David, you may not have heard this. A little breaking news here. Bob Woodward has a book out, uh, Obama's no Wars. Um, and What's it about? Uh, it's about you, among other people. I think you're uh, referred to in there as, uh, uh, by the President's National Security Advisor as part of the Politburo. Uh, uh, what's fascinating to me about this book, though, is that Bob didn't have to go to parking garages to get these sources. Uh, he came up the front driveway. I saw him sitting in the White House, the West Wing lobby, waiting for news. Why did you guys decide to cooperate so extensively with this book? Well, Bob, had, Bob is an excellent reporter. Uh, he's got great sources honed over decades. Uh, it was obvious that he had uh, quite a bit of information, uh, and it was important that uh, that information be placed in context. And so uh, we thought it was uh, uh, the, the right thing to do to work with him and to, uh, 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 and to sit down with him and work through some of the questions uh, that he had. And how do you feel it came out? You know, I, obviously the things that... Uh, you guys focus on are the palace intrigue aspects yes, of it. Yes, sir. I know, I know. <laughs> but uh, those who actually read the full book and, uh, will find that um, it tells the story of a president who ran a very, very rigorous, thoughtful, and tough process to uh, impose in Afghanistan a strategy that we frankly didn't have for seven and a half years before this uh, started. Uh, Secretary Gates said this is the first time that uh, Afghanistan uh, and, and the, the, the fight against Al Qaeda there has been fully uh, resourced. We lost a lot of time and we're trying to catch up uh, now because it's important. That's where we were attacked from. We have security interests uh, in doing that. But I think people who read the book will, will, uh, will see that the president was very much uh, focused on the right uh, things and finding a, th a thoughtful way forward. Uh, uh, did you talk to Bob? Uh, I did. Uh, how, how long or how often? Uh, I don't remember how long it was. I had a few <laughs> conversations with him. And are you glad you did? Yeah, I mean, I don't, there's, there's, um, I don't have any regrets uh, about talking to him. I, uh, what did uh, you learn in the book that surprised you? Um, honestly, I don't think I learned that much uh, that surprised me. I think, obviously, again, Bob has written many, many books. He's a master, not only is he a great journalist, but he's a master marketer. So he knows what the titillating kind of uh, tidbits uh, w you know you include in order to get press and uh, and sell books. But to me, the more interesting stuff really had to do with uh, what what we lived through, which is how that decision was made, the challenges and, uh, associated with it, uh, and um, so you know I wasn't I wasn't I just wasn't that surprised by what was in the book. All right, uh, we have another uh, question from Google in person. Uh, yes, thank you for taking my question. I'm Tim Farley with SiriusXM POTUS. Uh, I want to ask you about it from the standpoint of being a strategy expert and a marketing and a messaging uh, expert. Candidates are more often nowadays circumventing traditional media. We're in an evolving world. And uh, there are times when, well, the White House has at times withheld appearances on Fox, but there are Republican candidates who don't want to do interviews with traditional media. I guess the question is, as media, whether it's Internet, newspaper, television, radio, et cetera, evolve, is this going to be easier to do, to choose your place where you want to get your message across without having to go to traditional media? And if that is possible, is that going to be a good or a bad thing for democracy? Well, look, I, I think you raise a very good question. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I've, I was on Fox a, f a few weeks ago on a, on a Sunday, and I don't, I think it's healthy to, uh, to mix it up. The, the concern, the president raised this in a speech that he gave at the University of Michigan. The real concern is uh, not just where we appear, but the viewing and reading habits of uh, Americans. And uh, what, he, what he said was, don't just, I hope that people won't just watch the stations that affirm their point of view or read the newspaper that affirms their point of view, or go to the website that affirms their point of view, that it's healthy to get uh, uh, other opinions, even if you don't uh, uh, fully agree with them, and that's that is an, an important 
a part of democracy. And one of the concerns I have is that we, we get so polarized uh, in our, not, in, not just in our politics, but in our viewing habits, uh, that we simply don't hear other points of view. Can you still do it and win, though? Uh, I, I think that you can. I think you can, if you've got a, a solid argument. No, I mean, just go with somebody who's, a, if you will, a friend. In other words, just go oh, to the Oh, I media. see. Can you win an election you with know, just going to uh, people well, here's who are... Well, here's the reality, uh, and we started on, uh, on technology. Uh, so he, the reality is that people get information from many different places now, and, it, and not just from TV stations, but uh, uh, from, uh, from friends, uh, from uh, social uh, networks, from uh, a whole array of, uh, of sources. And uh, I think if you want to communicate with the American people, then you have to communicate as broadly uh, as possible. And, uh, and actually, for someone uh, like the president or someone uh, uh, on the Democratic side, I think there's more of an impetus uh, to do that. The truth is that uh, a lot of, at least uh, among conservatives, Republican conservatives, uh, Fox has, has a consolidated a base. Uh, Democratic supporters tend to be more diffuse in their uh, viewing habits. And so we have uh, an imperative, even from the standpoint of politics, to be as, uh, uh, as creative as we can in, in touching as many different uh, avenues of communication. And David, have you found that you need the mainstream media more than you had expected? Had you expected to be able to go around the filter more than you've been able to? You know, I don't know about that. I, I think we were aware, certainly the way we ran, we were aware that communications had changed uh, dramatically, but that, you know, uh, you know, you guys can still uh, uh, drive a story, and that um, uh, in today's world, some unfiltered piece of information that comes up on a blog or a uh, a website can uh, can dominate the mainstream media. So you know we live in a uh, we live in a new reality. We're we're aware aware of it. We deal with it, uh, and uh, we also understand that you know the day when the, the president of the United States could simply stand in front of a battery of uh, of uh, microphones at a at a press conference or a speech and command the attention of uh, the vast majority of. Uh, of voting Americans is 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 gone. That's it's not that simple, and so you have to work harder uh, to communicate, and uh, and uh, it, that's an imperative. Now, David, you know Chicago politics both as a recovering Chicago Tribune reporter and as a consultant. Um, if Rahm Emanuel runs for mayor in Chicago, what does he need to do? What would his chances be? Uh, what would his outlook be? Well, Rahm is a, as you know, a formidable. Uh, person, and he would be a very formidable candidate. He, he, he loves the city. Well, I'm not going to install him before he even announces what his intentions are. I'm not going to install him. And I think the, the, the thing that makes Rahm so formidable as a candidate is that he would never view himself uh, as a front runner, nor would he run as one. He understands that if he does make that decision, that he's going to have to do what he did when he ran for Congress and go door to door. He would start off every day at 6 in the morning at the L stops, and he'd finish at midnight at the firehouses. And I expect he'll do that same thing again. One thing I know about Chicago is nobody's going to hand you anything. You've got to earn it. And uh, he, he, you know he'll be prepared to do that if he runs. So he wouldn't run as a front runner. He would run how? He would run flat out. And, uh, for every vote. Uh, I think it's a terrible mistake to uh, uh, impute onto yourself uh, a front runner status. And uh, people would resent it, and they should. And uh, so, uh, you know, but that's not his style, that's not his way. Uh, David, there have been a couple articles that have talked about the toll that Washington has taken on you personally. I Look at me, I'm fading away to nothing. Uh, um, are you glad you did it? Do you agree? Can I tell you something? There, it takes a toll? I, and I see some of these people in this room, Republicans and Democrats. I've met some wonderful, wonderful people uh, here, and I, associations that I'll value for the rest of my life, and people who I think are well motivated and are doing this work for the right reason. I do get frustrated with the sort of the group pathology of Washington sometimes, the who's up and who's down and viewing everything through the prism of uh, the latest poll and elections. I'm not just, I'm not but staring at you years, for a reason, yeah, but Mike. Over, but, uh, but over the years, your team uh, has benefited from that as well. Yeah, but 
at the bottom line, this is a very critical time in the history of this country. We've got a lot of challenges and a lot of choices to make that will really determine uh, whether we're competitive in a global economy, the kind of lives our kids will lead. And there are serious issues, and, it, and we shouldn't just tunnel everything down into the kind of board game uh, of politics. So when people ask me about Washington, I say what my mother said to me when I was a child. She used to say, I love you, I just hate some of the things you do. So, um, What did you learn about Washington that you didn't know? Um, I don't, I, you know, the thing is that I don't, I didn't come in here uh, with any illusions. I knew that Washington, that Washington had, uh, folk, there were folks who came to work here who had the capacity to do very positive things. And then there was this other uh, aspect of it. And so nothing, nothing uh, okay, so surprised me. I do think that, you know, the media environment has evolved over time to the point where, um, you know, you have to spend an awful lot of time uh, dealing with uh, these white hot, white hot stories that a week later have faded into the rearview mirror and nobody can remember. And that, that takes up more energy than, uh, than you like. Uh, let me just say one thing about Washington, though. Uh, we ran uh, uh, our campaign on the premise that uh, change begins from the bottom up and that, uh, uh, you know, we wanted to come here and affect uh, uh, some changes that would help uh, people in communities uh, uh, accomplish what they wanted to accomplish. A good example is education reform where, you know, uh, Arne Duncan has done his race to the top. Uh, you've seen 48 states adopt higher standards, not because of a mandate from the federal government, but because of competition at the local level. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's so, a, so, so, so we try and keep our eye on the ball and remember why we were sent here. Okay, so David, next spring, will you leave Washington more optimistic about the country or more pessimistic? I'm always optimistic about the country. I think this is the great, I'm the son of an, an immigrant, and... Uh, uh, and as such, I mean, I'm very, I was, I was ingrained in me is a belief that this is the greatest country uh, in the world. And I still believe that. I think we have enormous capacities. I think we're unrivaled uh, in our productivity, in our innovation. I, I just want to see us take advantage of those things in a very challenging century so that my kids can have the same sense of optimism that I do. So why are you doing the re-election campaign in Chicago? Well, we haven't made that an announcement or decision, and I should add that, you know, uh, I'm a little presumptuous because the president hasn't formally announced his re-election campaign uh, either. Um, and so we'll make that decision later. Uh, but the argument for doing it there is that, uh, you know, uh, there is an element. I, one thing you asked me about Washington, this didn't surprise me, but it's something I know now more than ever, and that is there's a different conversation in this town than you hear at like Manny's, the deli where I hang out in Chicago. People don't talk about, I hate to say, the Politico over lunch in Chicago. They're talking about, you know, their kids and how they pay their bills and how their businesses are going and, and uh, you know, the normal things that people care about. Okay. It's healthy for a campaign to be rooted in that environment and not in the hot house of Washington. And David, as we say goodbye, you've become known for sneaking your iPad into meetings in the West Wing. I wonder what you use it for. Well, a variety of things. It depends on uh, whether my uh, Cubs are playing. Uh, MLB Live? Yes, MLB Live. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's really actually very useful because you can keep track of what's going on. Uh, and so what, do you, like what apps do you use? Well, political, of course. And uh, <laughs> I Google things all the time. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, but I mean, I have probably, I have many, many apps. Most of the news organizations uh, I have on there. I do have a few sports apps on there and keep track of that. Uh, and uh, and the, the one thing that I have on there and uh, that was a bad mistake is Pac-Man. And I do s waste more time than I should, even in meetings as I'm listening to people uh, do that. How do you do? To, you know, I'm, I'm breaking my personal records all the time, which is a bad <laughs> sign. Okay. Uh, David Axelrod, thank you for sitting down thank with you. us today. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much. I don't know about you, but I think I was a little surprised that he's playing Pac-Man in meetings, but that's just me. Thank you, Mike, and, and thank you, Mr. Axelrod, for your time.